Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here at the Dubai Air Show. Our coverage here is sponsored by FLIR Systems, and we're talking to Fred Cromer, who is uh, the president of uh, commercial aircraft uh, at Bombardier. Sir, thanks very much for making time uh, out of your, taking time out of your busy schedule to talk to us. Yeah, thank you. No, we're excited to be here. It's a great, uh, great show here in Dubai, and uh, you know, obviously, a lot of opportunity here in the Middle East. Uh, absolutely, and you, and you guys have uh, you know the star of your show that's uh, that's here, uh, the C series, as well as a whole suite of other aircraft you guys make. Um, there appear to be a couple of headlines associated with uh, with the product over the last couple of months. Uh, we've covered it closely because we cover, uh, even though we're a defense website, we do do quite a bit of commercial on our uh, weekly uh, podcast. Talk to us a little bit about sort of what's next in this drama. Uh, you know, Boeing brought the case against the C-Series, which it looked at as a threat to the 737. Uh, Commerce Department uh, ended up agreeing with that and taking some action and, and levying some, uh, or proposing to levy some very serious tariffs on that. Uh, you guys then struck a pretty extraordinary deal that, that uh, was a counter move with Airbus. Uh, basically selling 52% of that line, if I recall correctly, and then uh, for that aircraft to be manufactured at Airbus's plant in the United States, thereby changing the entire dynamic of the situation. Talk to us about what your case is against, you know, just two-part question. First one is, what's your case against or, or countering the U.S. government's accusation that you guys are effectively dumping, that, uh, that this is a fully subsidized product that you're bringing, you know, somehow illegally to the U.S. market? So just to be clear on that, and I've been in this industry for a long time and I've bought hundreds of aircraft, that you know, the C-Series and what we would call launch customer pricing is no different than how every other program starts. You have first movers, airlines that, that want to take a position in the early days, and they want to get compensated for that risk. Every new program does that, and the C-Series is no different than that. So to call our practice dumping and you know, which is basically what every OEM does when they introduce a new aircraft type, discount in the early days to compensate for the risk. It's common practice in the industry. So I would say that. Second, the uh, you described the Airbus partnership as a counter move. I want to correct the record here. It's not a counter move. We've been talking about partnerships on the C series in the two and a half years since I've been there, and we're very excited that Airbus has seen the potential of the C-Series, and now we have the ability to really unleash the value of the program with the Airbus partnership. Now, getting back to the dispute that we have with Boeing, what's next is the onus is on them to prove how they are damaged in a complaint and in a situation where they don't have a product that competes with our 100-seater aircraft. And Delta's been very clear since Delta's campaign and their purchase uh, was really spotlighted by Boeing in their complaint that they didn't invite Boeing to the table. They wouldn't have invited Boeing to the table because Boeing doesn't have an airplane that competes. So I, I think, you know, for us, that's, that's really kind of where we are in terms of the near-term next steps. Um, do you see any, um, is there sort of any antitrust clearance or antitrust hurdle that you have to get over in order to be able to start transferring manufacture of that aircraft uh, to the United States, to Alabama, where Airbus has its factory? No, I don't think we see any major hurdles. Uh, I, I think it's important as part of this discussion for, uh, for people to realize how much, even before the Airbus partnership, uh, is, is uh, is being manufactured in the U.S. to support the C-Series. We have over 50% content already coming from U.S. suppliers. That's $30 billion of investment over the life of the program and 22,000 jobs. Now, when you add on uh, the Airbus partnership and potentially building airplanes out of Mobile, Alabama, that's another $300 million investment in the U.S. and another 2,000 jobs. So when you combine all of that and talk about the U.S. content on the C-Series program, it's upwards of 60%. I would challenge any airline or any manufacturer uh, to demonstrate the amount of U.S. content that rivals the C-Series. So I think that's kind of missing from the conversation. The airplane is important to the U.S. It supports a lot of U.S. jobs, and now we will be manufacturing the airplane in the U.S. as well. Um, do you see any, um, I have to ask you that any time this kind of major shift happens, you guys do have an assembly line already that's running. Whenever this kind of a shift happens, there's always questions about whether or not you're going to be able to get that right, get bugs out of it, or whether it induces, introduces bugs and challenges to the program. What kind of gap, what kind of challenges, and what are some of the maneuvers and the discussions and talks you're having right now with Airbus to make sure that when this transition happens, it happens smoothly, seamlessly, and the product that's coming out of the United States is equal in quality 
uh, not a criticism, but there is a there are folks who are really up on the learning curve in Canada right now. Sure. I, first of all, let's clarify: it's not a shift. So this is purely incremental to what we're doing in Canada with the Airbus partnership. We see more volume coming on the program, so that's very exciting for the C series and everybody in Canada because it really is validating the product and all of the new technology that we've put to produce an aircraft like the C-Series that is unlike any other aircraft in that 100 to 150 seat category. So in terms of kind of ramping up a production line, we've got a long history at Bombardier of doing that and we're in the midst of our learning curve right now. So we can take all of that experience and all of that learning and transfer that into another production line that we've obviously already announced in Mobile. Um, and I'm, I apologize for having misspoke. That's right, it's not, it's not a shift, it's gonna be a second production line. Um, how do you respond? I mean, there, there was a friend of mine I was talking to, and, and I said, you know, I'm going I'm to have this conversation with you. And he said, hey, how do Canadian taxpayers feel that this was something that was a significant investment, uh, something that was very important for the future of the company that you guys sort of bet big on, and, and it's, a, it's a bet that's paying off? Um, look at it for, for something, you know, that Randy Tenseth is, you know, when I, when I spoke to him yesterday, you know, Randy said, like, you know, well, it was a, you know, it's a $1 deal at the end of the day. You know, do you face those kind of questions in Canada at all in terms of sort of the investment that was made and now somehow, uh, you know, how, how do you respond, respond to that? Well, I think, again, if we look at the excitement that's around the C-Series and what Canadian Aerospace and Bombardier have been able to produce, you know, I think people are very proud of, of the program and kind of where we are today. Now, when we talk about the partnership with Airbus and the increased volume that we expect by them coming into the program and leveraging all the positive momentum that, that we've achieved at Bombardier, we see a bigger program, we see more volume. And so the opportunity for Airbus to come in and contribute with their wor worldwide footprint in terms of customer service, marketing and sales, and their expertise, and really the size of their procurement organization, uh, leveraging what we're already doing at Bombardier, that, that is very exciting. And so, you know, the, the, the overall value of the program now increases, and so the value of what Bombardier's stake in that and even the government of Quebec's stake in that uh, is, is something that I think people are, are really focused on and excited about. Um, can you give us an update on, uh, on both the Q400 and the CRJ uh, line sales? Where are you in that process? So we've had a lot of recent success on the Q400. We announced uh, you know, a couple of months ago a, uh, a firm order for 25 aircraft plus 25 options for SpiceJet, a current customer. So they're reordering the aircraft and really furthering their strategy of introducing uh, aviation and, and flights into regions that, that don't have service today. So that's pretty exciting for us. And we have a couple of other uh, more recent announcements on the Q400. So we're, we're building the traction on the Q400. On the CRJ, we're excited because we've launched a new interior that we call the atmosphere interior, which really changes what people think about the regional jet uh, experience because it's got significant uh, more storage space for your overhead bags. It's got a new refreshed interior, more lighting, and the forward lav is much larger. So, you know, that we think that there's opportunities for the CRJ as well. So we've got, you know, excitement around all three of our product lines. Uh, we uh, was lucky enough, uh, uh, a company invited us to take a tour of their factory and we rode on one of your uh, newer business jets and I, I have to say that if I had some disposable income, I'd be talking to you about a deal on that. But I digress. Um, getting to uh, the uh, overall market projection, let me just go back for a second to the C-Series. You know, you guys have said, if I recall correctly, 6,000 airplanes over the next 20 years. Uh, Boeing and a couple of other guys sort of counter, uh, counter that uh, narrative. What makes you so bullish that that's the kind of figure you guys are going to hit with that airplane? Well, the market opportunity, we have said it's about six to 7,000 airplanes in that 100 to 150 seat category. It's a market that's largely underserved as both Boeing and Airbus have optimized their narrow body fleets around much larger seats count and has really left an opportunity in that 100 to 150 seat. And then here comes the C-Series, a clean sheet design airplane with a very aerodynamic fuselage, brand new wings, uh, latest technology, and then combine that with the geared turbofan. Uh, the, the passenger comfort and the economics that we're deliver, delivering on a unit basis rival much larger aircraft, and therein lies the power for the airlines, is that they have an aircraft that's got unit costs that rival much larger airplanes to start new markets, 
defend existing markets, create new connecting opportunities if they're a hub and spoke operator. And, and so for us, we feel very confident in that marketplace. And when you look at the statistics in terms of the number of passengers that are carried on any given flight, the 100 to 150 seat category is, is very ripe for more and more aircraft to come. And so that's, that's where our confidence comes from. Um, there, there was, uh, I was talking to one person at the show, and one of the criticisms they had of the airplane is, look, it's actually like a sort of a, a, you know, a, a bigger airplane that's carrying a lot more capability around on it uh, all the time. Is, is, that, is that a challenge? Is that an issue at all that, you're, that anybody's discussing with you, or is that a non-factor as far as you're concerned? Well, I would actually turn it around and say it's very positive. It's got a tremendous capability, and a perfect example is the airplane that we're showcasing here with Air Baltic. They're using it to open up new opportunities, and they're flying from Riga to Abu Dhabi. So they're connecting the Middle East as a new region in their, in their network. So the capability that we have, we're not sacrificing economics. The airplane is very, very competitive on a unit basis, on a trip cost basis. So we're not, we're not giving up on that, and we're actually adding value because of the performance capability of the airplanes. And, and to us, you know, that, that's got a lot of appeal for our customers. Um, let me ask you about NAFTA and some of the challenges that we've been seeing in the U.S.-Canada relationship. Obviously, the, uh, the disquietude over the C-Series is, is a piece of that. Uh, comments have been made both in the United States and in Canada sort of questioning uh, or, or at least raising concerns about what is, you know, America's, uh, you could argue, closest friendship. We share the largest undefended border in the world. Uh, but the NAFTA talks have been getting a little bit ornery. And, and you guys are a company that depend uh, a lot on the United States. Uh, there is a unique defense manufacturing agreement between the two nations that's unique. Uh, and, of course, then NAFTA on top of it. What are some of your concerns? What are some of the challenges, especially if the NAFTA talks break down? That, that you're going to be facing uh, in a couple of years' time? Well, we have a global business, and we have a global supply chain that supports our business, and a lot of that business, as I mentioned earlier, is based in the U.S. And so I think uh, as those conversations uh, progress, I think that recognition at the table and the number of U.S. jobs that we're supporting uh, by building the aircraft in Canada is very, very material. And I think it just will serve the talks well for people to focus on what are the facts. And if I use our aircraft as a, as the specific example, like I was talking before, that's $30 billion of investment into the United States to build the C-Series and over 22,000 jobs. I think that's very relevant. Those are very material numbers. And I think those are the kinds of things that really should inform how those discussion, discussions go at the table. Um, and uh, when you look at the special mission market, um, how many uh, Two-part question. Special mission market, you know, where do you, how do you see that evolving over the next couple of years, and how many units of all of your different sort of products do you see going into that? And then the secondary question is, does this issue on the C-Series in the United States change any of the dynamics, given that you guys are looking at certain opportunities in the United States as well? Uh, on the mission I side, you know, that's, that's a business that we've been in for quite some time. We've got great aircraft, whether it's a business aircraft or one of our commercial aircraft, to provide a platform for those special mission capabilities that, that you know, is so important to governments and defense, you know, around the world. So some of that's hard to predict because it depends on, you know, sort of the buying cycle and the renewal cycle of some of that, as well as new technology that, that comes to bear. And certainly the performance capability of our craft, our aircraft, uh, you know, is, is very useful in that. So it's tough to predict, but we're always there to, you know, to support the needs uh, with some of our defense partners when, when we get there. And the second piece of your question related to the C-Series and remind me, uh, well, yeah, that's right. <laughs> I, I did hit you with a, with a whale of a question. Yeah. Uh, so thank you. Very well done, uh, yeah. Fred, on the beginning part of that question. The second, <laughs> the second part of the question was, um, you know, does the challenge over the C-Series and the debate and some of the NAFTA stuff disadvantage you in any way in pursuing, you know, the, the, you, you are partnered with American Primes on pursuing, uh, you know, work in the United States uh, for the special mission field. You guys have been looking at that for a long time. Talk to us about whether or not you think it handicaps you at all in some of these competitions where you're looking to get into the Pentagon. Yeah, you know, actually, I think it, it actually benefits us. I mean, the C-Series is the latest example of innovation in Canadian aerospace and certainly at Bombardier. And when we bring that kind of innovation to the marketplace, whether it's for a commercial application or a defense application, I think it's relevant and it'll continue the conversation. So again, you know, we have a long partnership with the U.S. I think that'll continue. 
And I think, you know, those are the kinds of things that need to get discussed at the table. What are we doing at Bombardier? How are we advancing our industry? And the C-Series is a perfect example. Uh, last question. Uh, does the partnership or a partnership with Airbus uh, lead to uh, defense manufacturing potential opportunities. I mean, you know, the Canadian government's pretty clear. It's it's been very disappointed with uh, the suit that was brought against you guys. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion that you know maybe as now is not the time to buy Boeing F-18s. Uh, and there are some you know that fighter competition. Last I checked, is something that is still ongoing. Uh, whether you know Canada was was once part of the Joint Strike Fighter program, it's observing you know, the government you know backed away from it, but it's it, it's still yet to be decided. Does that open an opportunity for, for there to be a broader partnership with, with Team Airbus that goes beyond just the C-Series? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, I can't be an Airbus spokesman, but I can tell you the comments that have been made when we announced this partnership, was, which was, uh, you know, really focusing on Canada as another country uh, to add to the Airbus portfolio in terms of where it sources, in terms of supply. And that's pretty exciting for Canadian aerospace. So when you think about the supply chain on an annual basis of what Airbus is, is purchasing, to quote them, it's about $83 billion a year. That's exciting for Canada and can potentially mean more business and a closer relationship between Airbus and Canada. So beyond that, I think it's more appropriate to ask Airbus, you know, kind of what their thoughts are on that. But, you know, certainly what they've been talking about in terms of the partnership with Bombardier is getting closer, not just to us in the JV for the C-Series, but certainly with Canadian Aerospace. Um, I also just thought of an out-of-the-box question to ask you, which is, you guys are in the smaller part of the market. Obviously, C-Series does change the dynamic, but, you know, very much sort of regional uh, hops. You know, you could drive that long, but you'd much rather take an airplane and get there a little bit faster. Have you guys considered at all how autonomous, self-driving cars are going to change that economic model where folks could potentially get into their vehicle at night after work, have a drink, cars driving them, stop by, have a sandwich, car keeps going, and you know, you, you do an eight hour trip you might not otherwise want to drive, but hey, if you're sitting in the back seat and taking a snooze, you're willing to do that. Have you guys looked at how that massive technological shift, shift that's going to be societally changing may potentially impact your commercial aircraft business? Well, I think, uh, you know, it's early days on that, and that's something that, you know, as just a normal course, we would try to understand the impact on what that would mean in terms of aviation, people's, you know, willingness to fly. And I think the fact of the matter is it's still going to be faster to fly than to take a car, whether you're driving it or not. So I think the convenience factor of air travel is still always going to be there. There's been challenges to that over the years. But I think, you know, the fact that, that uh, the airplanes can be more efficient uh, and, you know, continue to, you know, sort of fill that.